So I'm sharing it now. So I hope everyone can can see it. Okay. So for today, uh, we will be talking about the overview of organization and management. Uh, later on, you will have an appreciation where the IT comes into the picture. If you see and read the title, IT Organization and Management, this will be uh, explained a little bit later. But for our purposes, the real foundation for this course is hinged on these two concepts, organization and management. And if you think about it, the field of organization and management is quite broad. It is deep at the same time. In fact, it has its own separate programs, right? Where IT comes into the picture, it will be a specification of that particular domain or field. But nevertheless, the concepts that is taught or, or, or shared in that broader field of organization and management, that is something that is applicable for this course when made specific for IT. Now, this is generally our, our outline or agenda for this particular session. So we will talk about organization. What's this animal all about, if you think about it. And then later on, we will talk about management. And you will notice that we will be going in and out of these fields later on as we progress in our course. So sometimes we will be talking things about organization and then we'll be moving in into management and then we'll moving me back to organization and then moving back again to management and so on and so forth. So the concepts of organization and management really overlap and that's to be expected. But for our purposes, at least for the overview, we will try to look at these concepts separately, temporarily, and later on we will make them merge. We're not really a full merge, but a certain degree of overlap later on. So let's talk about organization first. So what is organization? Okay. Uh, well, this is like a Googleable definition. I'm sure there are many statements that would define what an organization is. But let's take a look at this specific definition because this really uh, points to a lot of elements uh, which will be discussed in our course throughout this term. So an organization is said to be a social unit of people that is structured and managed to meet a need or to pursue a collective goal. And so you can look at it into three big parts based on this definition. So the first part is that it's a unit of people. Okay? It's a collective of people. You can look at it that way. And it's social. So therefore, there's a certain element of interaction. Okay? Uh, within that particular collective or unit. Okay? And that unit, that structure, that uh, collective is structured and managed. So it's not just some sort of random collection of people, right? Like it's not a crowd wherein if you go outside and if you go and see a busy intersection, for example, well, you can see a collective of people there but they're not structured, they're not even managed. So a crowd is not an organization in that respect. So it's a social unit of people, it's a set of collective that is structured and managed. There's a certain level of deliberation in organizing this group of people. And basically the reason why you want to group and structure and manage this, this, this group of people is that there's a purpose, okay? And typically the purpose is to meet a need or to pursue a collective goal. So in a simpler sense, you can see or appreciate organizations as something that is deliberate. So it's a deliberate collective of people. Okay. And the interaction uh, within that organization is actually the purview of management, which we'll talk about in a while. But let's like appreciate what organization is about. Let's try to understand and unpack the the ideas uh, as we go along right now. So organizations are, well, primarily open systems. They affect and they are affected by their environment. So they are not closed systems. Uh, and this is an important aspect because you will realize 
that certain groups, uh, if they are constructed as organizations, they still impact the environment where they're situated in. So organizations can't say that we don't care about society or we don't care about the country or we don't care about politics and government or the, we don't care about world issues. That shouldn't be in the minds of those people running these organizations because organizations are primarily open systems. They are uh, structured, they are managed according to some internal logic. At the same time, they have a way of actually impacting those around them outside of the boundaries of organization. Okay. And, well, because they can affect those around them, they can be affected. So they can be influenced. Okay. And, and this is why it shouldn't be a a habit or practice of people thinking that they don't care of what's happening out, out there. They shouldn't have this sense of indifference because really there's, there's really no choice. Organizations will be affected by their environment and they also affect the environment, whether they're conscious about it or not. And that's the sad part, right? Sometimes because of their indifference, they fail to appreciate that certain actions that they do they actually affect the environment, whether they're aware of it or not. Uh, things in relation, let's say, to environmental sustainability. Okay, I mean, that's pretty much the, the, the rave right now. They'd want organizations to be responsible for the environment. But uh, a lot of these organizations, they don't understand or appreciate that they really affect the environment uh, significantly. They're thinking that, you know, they're probably a small environment, sorry, small, small small organization, a small company, that they are thinking, well, I'm just small. I don't think I'll affect the environment that much. Well, whether they affect the environment that much or not, that's beside the point. They still affect the environment. Okay. Now, let's talk about the types of organizations. Uh, in this case, the category or the typology is based on the size of the organization or based on its structure, okay? So you can have a tall organization or a flat organization. Now a tall organization, you can envision this as many levels, like a building having many floors. Uh, from an image standpoint, that would be something like a tall organization, okay? So it's a multi-tiered social unit, okay? And each tier would have certain authority, certain power affecting those above and below. So there's a certain level of nuance as to the level you're in. And the tiering starts on the entry-level workers. So they're typically uh, imagined to be at the bottom of the organization, all the way up to the top managers of the company. So they would be like the penthouse floor of our building analogy. And certain organizations, they can be very tall. So they can have many layers, many levels of organization. Or they can be, you know, I mean, sizable enough, but the extreme sense of a tall organization with just one floor is a flat organization. Okay, but uh, and the characteristic uh, of a tall organization is that as you move higher and higher in the organization, you have more and more control in terms of decision making. In that sense, a lot of the decision making is centralized, typically at the topmost level of the organization. Now, you might encounter uh, some literature that talks about what you call the property that describes the height of the organization. Well, you call that organizational depth. Uh, and usually, a lot of the organizations uh, are, are tend to be very deep, okay, or, or tall, as, as, as the case might be. Uh, I know for a fact that multinational organizations can have organizational depth as big as eight or nine. That would mean that the number of levels between a typical employee and the CEO or the president of the company would be like eight or nine levels. Okay. Uh, in some IT organizations, uh, for example, I used to work in Hewlett Packard back in the 2000s in 
earlier parts of 2010s, um, the organizational depth of the entire Hewlett Packard, we had like 320,000 employees, but the organizational depth was around six. So think about it, like uh, 320,000, that's probably the population of a, of a small municipality here in the Philippines. And it can have like six layers of, of, of control, six layers of decision making, so to speak. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you can have a flat organization. It's just one level. And in that sense, everyone is equal. Okay, Everybody manages themselves, so there's nobody above everybody else. Of course, there are some nuances. Like uh, startups typically follow a flat organization at the start. But even if they're flat, there's that deference to the founder Okay, or to a very senior person, like they call the employee number one or the employee number two. So these, these are the typical uh, unwritten rules in a flat organization. It's not completely flat. There's some level of hierarchy that is not structured uh, formally. Okay? But in general, a flat organization is self-managed, uh, said to work best uh, for small and medium enterprises or SMEs. And the important characteristic of a flat organization is that decision-making is decentralized or everybody is, is or should be expected to do their own decision-making uh, by themselves. They don't really need to seek approval all the time from their top-level managers. So, so that's the, the, the situation uh, for, for, for a flat organization. Now, in the case of the university, of UANP, um, you can consider it as a, as a tall organization. And you'd probably look at it perhaps in three or four uh, levels. Uh, the very first level, you'd have the, the management committee. And underneath the management committee, you'd have the operations committee of the various academic schools and units. And within those uh, schools, uh, you will have your program directors or department chairs. And then underneath that, you'll have the actual faculty and staff. So in the case of UANP, you would have an organizational depth of four. Okay. Uh, is that a tall organization, you might ask? Uh, that question needs to be uh, answered relative to other organizations within the same industry. So it's not an absolute question wherein you can say UANP is tall or UANP is closer to flat. Uh, it would really depend on the typical uh, configuration of other organizations that are similar to UANP. In that sense, you will have to look, what about other schools? What about other universities? How tall are other universities? Okay, so. Is it going to have the same depth as four, like UANP? Is it more? Is it less than four? Okay, that's something for, for us to appreciate uh, as we go and analyze certain industries. So the long and short of it is that the type of organization doesn't really tell you off the bat which one is good or which one is bad, right? In some cases, a tall organization would be good. In other cases, a flat organization would be good. So it's going to be very situational. Nevertheless, it's good that you understand these different types so that you have a good understanding of, okay, for this particular situation or for this particular circumstance, maybe an organization with a certain depth is necessary. Or maybe an organization that's completely flat is necessary. Okay. We'll talk more about that as we go along in this course. Now, in a tall organization, there are still some classes or some categories, if you may. And we will be talking about three types of tall organizations okay, or three variations of a tall organization. The first variation is a functional organization. And this is the typical configuration of most companies right now. Uh, this is also known as a bureaucratic structure. Now, when we say bureaucratic, it tends to have a negative connotation. But if you know the root or the etymology of bureaucracy, so bureau, uh, this means board, okay, or 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 in, in in more simpler terms, an office. So so an office meaning a function. Okay, so bureaucracy, 
would have its roots in the French way of how organizations were designed. So back in the Industrial Revolution, okay, how the Europeans have set up their organization, well, this was uh, the, the first thing that came, came into mind. Okay, let's gather ourselves together. These will be factories, for example, in the Industrial Revolution. Why don't we organize ourselves according to the function or the activity that we do? And that's the start of your structures in, in, in organization. Okay. And the, the logic is simple. Okay? It divides the firm's operation based on specialties, based on skills, based on what they can do. Okay. It's not based on what uh, their titles would be. Okay. So it's based on their function. And what are the benefits of a functional organization? Well, there's total specialization of work. In some cases, not really total, but, but there is specialization of work. You know that work can be specialized or can be subdivided further into, into teams that operate based on their uh, skills or based on their specialty. Now, every employee gets professional guidance from a specialist or a so-called expert who is typically the one who leads that particular team or that particular office. Later on, as we go through this course, you will, you will appreciate and realize that sometimes the experts aren't really the best leaders of their offices, but we'll, we'll get to that in a while. Okay. And another benefit of a functional organization is that work is performed more efficiently since each manager is responsible for a single function. Now, is there a company right now uh, that really follows a functional organization? Well, there's one. An example would be Apple. Apple is now actually structured as a functional organization. Before, it was structured uh, as a different type of organization, uh, a divisional organization, which we will uh, talk in a while. But now, um, they actually reorganize themselves, and they're now functional. In, in structure or functional in, in configuration. Now, what are the limitations of a functional organization? Well, there's delay in decision making. Um, because you are structured such that people work according to their functions or according to their activities, you're unable to see all the other activities in a, in a complete chain, right? Uh, for example, if you're in a manufacturing type of organization, so obviously you start with the raw materials first, and then you do some processing of that of those raw materials, and then you package them, and then you sell them, and then you probably have some after-sales support. So in that very long chain, okay, uh, typically called the product life cycle, there are many functions along the way. And if you are structured as a functional organization, you don't have visibility of what the other parts in the chain are doing, okay? Which can cause problems because of the delay in decision-making, okay? So this is how a functional organization would look like as far as a hierarchy would go. So you have a CEO at the top, and then you probably have finance and development. I mean, there could be more, okay? But under a certain function, you could have sub-functions, which would still be structured in the same way or in the same philosophy as a functional organization. So in other finance, you have people doing collections. So accounts receivable, okay, or budgeting, those were uh, uh, concerned about uh, managing the, the fiscal uh, discipline of the organization under development. You can have mobile, you can have cloud, okay. So, so that's the, the work, or that's how uh, a functional organization would look like. Now, what are the other business units that can be inside a functional organization? Okay, so is that possible that you can have business units under functional organizations? Well, this is where the idea of a divisional organization comes into the picture. The functional organization is organized according to their activities or what they can do. A divisional organization is structured around a market or a product, or a specific group of consumers. So that's the main difference between a divisional organization and a functional organization. Okay, and this is how it's going to look like. So under the CEO, you probably have two types of markets. You have the enterprise market. 
so big companies as your customers, or you can have the emerging market, where you have customers that are new, that are probably experimental, perhaps. So you have an organization that tackles uh, different types of markets. And under these uh, divisions, you can have subdivisions. So depending on the enterprise, you can have a supermarket or a boutique, you can have specialty stores or kiosks. Now, it's possible actually to mix and match the divisional organization and the functional organization. Okay, uh, you, can, you can have a combination of both. So it's not an either or situation. It's not something that you can only choose either a divisional or a functional organization setup. You can actually have a combination of both. In fact, if you think about it, UANP is something like that. It's something, it's like a divisional organization, right? Um, you're divided according to schools. Okay, so each school would have their own set of programs. So they actually cater to a specific set of consumers, or in this case, students, specific set of students. But within these schools, you'd have common functions that are present across different schools. Okay, so you have people taking care of student care, student affairs. So you have staff, individual staff uh, that does student affairs work in, let's say, the School of Sciences and Engineering or in the School of e Education or School of Economics. They would have employees that actually does the same function, which is student affairs. Or under each school, you'd have people doing alumni affairs. So that's also the same. Okay. Uh, or in other cases, the, the organizational cut is based on the function. And then underneath is each function would be specific divisions. That can happen that way. So the point here is that uh, the divisional organization or the functional organization is not a fixed organization. It can be a combination of both. Again, depends on what the organizational objective would be. Now, the last type of an organization, a tall organization, would be a matrix organization. So in this case, you have more than one reporting managers. Uh, in a sense, you have two chain of command. Okay, So you have a functional manager, which is typical of the functional organization. Okay? But at the same time, in the matrix organization, you report to project managers. And uh, later on, when you deal with project management, you know that projects are temporary in nature. So they have a start, they have an end. And that project has an objective. Perhaps it will implement something or it will affect certain changes and whatnot. It has a start and has an end. And that project has a certain leader. And that leader is called the project manager. So it's possible that you, you are reporting to a functional manager, but you're also reporting to a project manager at any given point in time. Okay, so that happens. Now, the matrix organization, if I'm not mistaken, was a, a, an innovation done by IBM okay, back in the late 70s, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe in the early 70s, wherein uh, how organization theory came into the picture, it was pretty much functional, right? And then later on, they realized that as the organization grew, the organization is actually catering to more than one market. So now you have a divisional organization. And later on, um, they realized that in order for them to be robust, which is expected in an IT organization, they dabbled into what is now known as the matrix organization. Okay, So the main characteristic of a matrix organization is that you are reporting to two managers. Okay? Now it has pros and cons, okay? obviously. Uh, and when we take a look at the pros or the benefits, uh, the matrix organization really articulates the company's mission and objectives very well. That's the danger also of functional organization because you don't have visibility across the entire chain. Okay? People working in their own functions don't really relate on how their work actually helps impact the end goal of the organization. Right. For example, if you are a company that does cell phones and you're just responsible for making those chips that control voice, for example, okay, you don't really appreciate how cell phones are really sold in the market or how cell phones actually impact society at large. You just don't because the work that you do 
is just specific to that chip that takes care of voice. So that's the danger of a functional organization. You don't have visibility across the organization. And that's the advantage of a matrix organization this time around. Now, the matrix organization uh, highlights the effective use of limited resources. Okay? So depending on your project, your project will only pull in specific functional people. But once they're done, because it's a project, because it's temporary in nature, uh, once the project is completed, then the functional resources are released. Okay? So, and those functional resources can be used for other later projects. And another benefit, and uh, this is validated by, by management research as well, is that it helps in the retention of professionals. In other words, they don't get bored. As long as there are projects, uh, these professionals, these specialists, these functional people, they have something to do. And that keeps them motivated. That also sharpens their skills as they go through their careers in the organization. And you know, they, they feel motivated to stay. So those are the benefits. But obviously, as there are benefits, there are also uh, risks uh, or dangers to, to a matrix organization. Okay, um, There could be confusion in terms of instructions because now you're reporting to more than one manager. Uh, there could be, in the case of multiple projects, you might run into shortages of resources. Okay? Uh, and that can create stress and burnout to everybody within the organization. But there are many uh, other limitations to a matrix organization. Um, but for now, for our purposes, just to give you a little bit of appreciation about it, well, uh, this is how a matrix organization works, and there are pros and cons to that. Now, this is how a matrix organization would look like. So in this case, if you're working in a telco industry, you have a globe uh, account. So and you have a smart account. Okay? And under each account, okay, you have project managers and lead developers. So if you've noticed, functionally speaking, development, they're all working on both projects. But they're actually perhaps dedicated or shared across uh, the accounts. Now, a matrix organization, another way of, of describing the matrix organization would be an organization that is divided into accounts. And the IT industry, the IT organizations or IT companies are typically organized in this way. So it's good for you to understand that perhaps the old way of understanding hierarchy in an organization, when you're in IT, it's as if you have many bosses but uh, along the way, you will appreciate how to navigate that particular um, a field, okay? Like, who do you need to appease or who do you need to, to cater at certain points in time? You'll learn that along the way. Uh, but definitely, as far as giving you something uh, preemptive is concerned, right? Uh, expect that if you do intend to build your career in the IT industry, you will have an experience working in a matrix organization. Now, there are things that you consider when you want to choose the type of organization, right? Uh, you take a look at its size. As I said a while ago, Hewlett Packard used to have like 3, 320,000 uh, employees. So what would be an appropriate organization type? Later on, when we talk about globalization, that also kicks in, right? Uh, how do you organize organization across countries, across geographies? You also want to consider the life cycle. Okay, both of the product and of the company. So what is the appropriate organization if the life cycle of your product is pretty long? It's dependent on consumers. It's also dependent on your suppliers. Okay? Or if your organization is a startup or it's a mature organization uh, or an organization that's probably 70 years old or 100 years old. We have a lot of organizations, especially in the Philippines, that's more than 100 years old. Banks, for example, um, like for example, the, the Bank of Philippine Islands, they're more than 150, almost 160 years old. Okay, so you may want to consider what's the appropriate organization for that. Will a flat organization work for an old organization? And of course, the business environment. Um, what industry are you working in? Is it IT? Is it in the financial sector? Is it... Uh, 
Is it manufacturing? Is it retail? Okay. Is it healthcare? Okay. And you also take a look at the politics or the government uh, involved. Is the government favorable? Is the state uh, very restrictive? Okay, are there uh, heavy regulatory requirements? Okay. So that's part of your business environment. Uh, there's no cookie cutter way of determining ah for for this size, for this life cycle, this for this business environment. Okay, this is the org type. That, that doesn't really work that way. And you will also realize that organizations change over time. They undergo reorganizations or reorg for short. So there's no one static correct org type for every organization. They can change. Just as your size would change, just as your life cycle would change, just as your business environment would change, your organizational type will change. In fact, in the IT organizations that uh, I've been to, um, or in the IT industry, uh, I've seen that organizations undergo reorganization in less than 18 months. So if you pick an IT company right now, and if you wait 18 months later, or a little bit over next year, the organization type next year might be different from the organizational type now. That can happen, and that's quite possible. Uh, there are some cases where in reorgs can happen in less than a year. You might uh, find it funny, especially if you start working, that in a typical year, you might have been reporting to three or four bosses in one year because of reorganizations. So as companies undergo reorganizations, they also change the reporting managers. So uh, back then it was quite uh, quite amusing, right? Uh, there was a year where I had four managers in one calendar year. Well, that's... That was stressful to some degree because as you were adjusting to one manager, then you were changing, you've changed to another manager and so on and so forth. Imagine doing that for four, four times, right? So, so, so that's, that's pretty, pretty challenging. But uh, this is not to scare you, but this is to in a way prepare you. Okay, this is possible. You will expect uh, IT companies changing frequently. Sometimes for the better, um, those reorganizations happen uh, because they're useful, they're important. Other times, the reorganization, in hindsight, may not be important or may not be necessary. But you can only say these things only after the fact, unfortunately. Now, why is it that organizations need to be structured? Okay, I mean, it's part of the definition of an organization. It has to be structured. Okay, There's a certain level of deliberation on how they're organized, right? Well, for one, better communication. It's possible for you and everybody else to communicate things that are in support of the mission and vision of the organization. Okay. This is something that you will be hearing very often that organizations typically have a vision and a mission and a set of objectives. And if there's no structure, okay, then it is very difficult for organizations to accomplish their mission or achieve their vision, right? And a part of it, if they're structured, then it's it's very feasible for the members of that organization to communicate with one another. Another uh, reason why you want to have structure in an organization is that it helps you set priorities. You know what's important, you know what's not important, it could be deferred, and the structure will help uh, negotiate uh, that, <laughs> excuse me, they'll negotiate that prioritization for you. And another uh, implicit advantage of an organizational structure is that it helps employees perform better. Okay. Now, choosing a type of organizational structure is important. It is crucial to help operations run smoothly. So this is pretty important. Now we move on to the second part of our overview, which is management, okay? And there are many types of management. Believe me, when we're done with the overview, we've just probably skimmed through the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg, okay? Uh, and it's a very interesting field to study as well, right? Uh, perhaps you might consider the study of management as a field in social sciences because we're dealing with people. 
But let's talk more about that and let's let's understand uh, a few basic things about management. Well, you can look at management as a noun or as a verb. So as a noun, what is management? Management can be a group of individuals okay, who challenges and oversees a person or a collective group of people in efforts to accomplish desired goals and objectives. Now, management would be a subset of the organization. And what is their function? Their function is really to challenge and oversee other people. So management is another function. And it's a specific type of function within an organization, which we will unpack also in this course. Okay. And their role really is to make sure to oversee, to monitor the efforts to accomplish the desired goals and objectives of the organization. Now, as a verb, management is the act of getting people together to accomplish these desired goals and objectives using available resources efficiently and effectively. In case you're wondering the difference between efficiency and effectiveness, okay, um, a good shorthand would be like this. Doing things efficiently uh, or efficiency is doing things right. Okay, doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. Okay, so normally that's how you differentiate efficiency from effectiveness. In, in which case we want both to happen. Okay, so it's not a trade-off in that sense. You can be efficient and effective. But I want you to be very particular with the difference because as people use it, you need to be clear on the context on how it's used. So when we say effective or effectiveness or effectivity, we're actually looking at the right thing. Okay. So is this the right thing? Okay. So it should answer the what in a way, right? But when we're talking of efficiency or doing things efficient. Okay, we're talking about doing things right. So this is the how, right? This, 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 this dwells on how. Are we doing the things right? Okay. Perhaps there's a procedure or, or uh, a set of steps that need to be done. If you do them by the book, then you're doing things right. So, so that's the difference. And later on in, in your, the course of your own experience, you'll be able to differentiate uh, these, these two terms. Okay. So those are the two definitions of management as a noun or as a verb. Now we go to the overview of the management process now as a function. And you can uh, shorthand it uh, into four different processes. P-O-L-C, or in other books, they call it P-L-O-C, PLOC or Paul L C, okay, Paul, Paul C. So planning, organizing, leading, controlling. So you start with planning at the top, as you see it, then you go clockwise, organizing, leading, controlling. So these are the four things that you expect to do in management. So when we're managing, okay, people, organizations, or as a manager, typically it's just one of four things, P-L, P-O-L-C in this case. So planning, organizing, leading, controlling. We'll talk about that in a, in a while. Now, what are the different four main resources needed to run your business? So when we talk about four different resources, so what's being managed? So the human resources, that's one, people. Uh, what is under the purview of the manager? Financial resources, money, funds, even revenue coming from, from customers. Okay. Those are financial resources. What are other types of resources? Technological resources, the technology that you use, and natural physical resources, like raw materials, inputs. Okay? This would be resources that are being managed. Okay, but just to help differentiate a little bit further, when we talk about technological resources, these would be resources that are in aid of the processes within an organization. So that's the typical economic definition of technology. Technology as we know it now, we think of high technology. We think of computers, we think of computing power, we think of all the fancy uh, stuff that we probably see in, in sci-fi uh, literature, okay? 
But when we talk about technology, uh, conceptually, we talk of something that is in aid of how things are operating or th how things are operated. Okay, that's technology. So, of course, computers help us do our jobs well, right? Uh, but natural or physical resources, this would pertain to the actual raw materials, the goods that are used to produce the end product that your organization is doing. Okay. So just to help you differentiate three and four, okay, technology is something that is supportive of the organization. Natural physical resources, this would be the inputs to the things that you are doing okay, in, 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 in your company. Now, what are the three types of management? So we've talked about types of organizations earlier. What about management? Are there types? Well, there are three types. So you have the traditional management, you have team management, and servant management. Uh, well, in the traditional management, you have a hierarchy of employees. Okay? No, that's why it's traditional. Uh, in here, manager sets out expectations for employees who need to meet the goals. So your manager simply tells the employees, Okay, this is what I expect you to do. These are your targets. This is, and that's it. And more often than not, uh, managers don't even care anymore after they've communicated those expectations. Now, team management is slightly different from traditional management, okay? Now, the manager is part of the team, and it's like a guiding hand that helps the members of that team work together to solve problems. Okay, so they're there to solve problems. There's a team, okay? They, they try to solve problems. But in this case, managers doesn't dictate the policy often. Oftentimes, the policy is dictated or agreed upon by the members of the team. So that's how team management works. So everybody in the team, they discuss. They probably have some debates. But at the end of all of that, they will decide, okay, this is what the team should be doing. And that becomes policy. Unlike in the traditional setup, it's the manager who really brings down the, the policy. No questions asked. If I'm the manager, if I tell you this, that's law. Okay, you follow that. Okay, And if my manager tells me that I do X, Y, Z, that's law. I have to do X, Y, Z. Under team management, well, that's not really the case, at least in the pure sense of the figure. Uh, team management uh, works collectively. Everybody decides or agrees on what really gets followed. Uh, and, and that's what passes as law. So that's team management. Uh, and later on, okay, so the, the other type of management is servant management. So here, managers help supply resources that the employees need to meet the company's goals. Now, you can look at the three types of management in this way. In the traditional sense, the manager is above the employee. In team management, the manager and the employee are on the same level. In the servant management, it's like the manager is underneath the employee. So you can look at that uh, or see these three types of management in that uh, simplified uh, visual uh, consideration. But there's more, it's more to that, right? Uh, it's possible that you can have a combination of any of these three types. You can have a traditional and team management working in an organization. Right, So in the case of UANP, uh, the president of the university is part of the management committee. Okay, The president uh, has a traditional authority over the other members of the management committee, but they also perform as a team. So they decide on things collectively as a team. So you can have both ways. Okay? And of course, in UANP, there's also that sense of servant leadership or servant management in that sense, wherein certain leaders need to be able to provide resources for certain people within their particular organization. So that's even possible. So it's a combination, okay? It's not static, but for purposes of appreciation or for purposes of study, we can look at management into these three different types. Okay. Uh, and, you know, all the rave about servant leadership, you probably have may have encountered this in my books. Um, Authors include, let's say, John Maxwell, uh, Ken Blanchard. Um, those would have been the, back in the old days, in the 90s and even the 2000s. Now the more popular speakers would be Simon uh, Sinek. You'd have uh, Adam Grant even. Uh, 
they're the ones who will probably push or promote uh, uh, servant leadership okay? or leadership that is generous, okay? in the case of Adam Grant, for example. In any case, uh, we can uh, leave this subtopic of the types of management with this uh, phrase, right? That the high purpose, high level purpose of management is to serve customers because serving customers uh, in order to obtain a profit is the crux of every business. Now, when we're dealing with organizations, primarily we're dealing with for-profit organizations. We're not really dealing with nonprofit organizations right now, although the concepts that you learn here will also be applicable to nonprofits. But generally, if you have a company, if you have an organization, it needs to generate surplus or profit in that sense. So again, if we go back, okay, the high level purpose of management is to serve customers. Okay? Because serving customers in order to obtain a profit is the crux of every business. It's crucial to every business. And this is where good management comes into the picture. So what constitutes good management? Okay? Uh, good managers constantly streamline their organizations toward making a sale. Okay? If you are serving customers and the customers are satisfied or they've served adequately, then you're, you're a good manager. There's good management there. But also, it, uh, it needs to ensure that everything is done ethically. Everything is above board. Okay, ensures that everything that is being done ethically geared towards what the customers want. You're not cutting corners. You're not doing something that is unethical or borderline illegal. Okay, um, you don't want to do that. Even if your intention might be um, understandable, but everything that you do, it has to be ethical. It has to be moral. Okay, and oftentimes when we deal with people handling businesses, you know, there, there's always that tension. Uh, for us to be really, really good in business, sometimes we have to be the idea of, of ethics, right? Uh, we want to make sure that everything that we do is, is ethical, is, is moral, right? Um, that's also a separate subject matter of business ethics. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about business ethics later on in the course. Okay? So everything that is being done... Uh, uh, should be ethically geared towards what the customers want. Now, sometimes the customers might want something that is unethical. We're not obligated to fulfill that. Okay, so that's something that you want to keep in mind as well. Now, good managers regularly take educated risks and exercise good judgment. Now, you know, it's management is not black and white. Yes, you'll probably be looking at some literature that tells you that management is scientific. But it's rarely black and white. It's rarely mathematical, if, if I may, right? There's always going to be a lot of gray areas. And managers become good managers based on experience, um, um, based on making mistakes also and learning from those mistakes in order for them to carve out your judgments. So a good manager should know how to try new things, experiment, knowing how to adjust when change exists, and developing other people, and even personally taking stock of skills, okay? improving themselves. Okay? There's this anecdote. Uh, there's a young leader talking to a very senior seasoned leader. Okay? And the young leader consulted the, the senior leader, right? uh, asked the question, sir, uh, how did you become successful to where you are now. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that was a that was a sensible question. And the senior leader answered, uh, well, uh, simply put, good decisions. Okay. So he became a very successful leader because of good decisions. Okay. Okay. So the young leader took note of that, scribbled something in his notebook. And then the young leader had a follow-up question. Sir, how did you form good decisions? And then the senior leader said, bad decisions. Okay. Uh, well, in a way, it's a, it's a funny anecdote of some sorts. Uh, sometimes the only way for you to learn good decisions is by making bad decisions. Okay. But it's not for the sake of doing bad decisions, right? I mean, 
you, sometimes when you do certain things, you had goodwill. You thought it was good, but later on you realize it's bad and you learn from it. And, and that's why good management is not very scientific in the sense that it's not black and white. It's not like you have like a, uh, like a periodic table of elements and, you know, you have all these things, you know, if you combine uh, hydrogen and oxygen, you'll come up with, with water. It's, it's not like that. It's, it's not like that. Sometimes it might be predictable in some cases, but maybe in your case, it might be different, even if you've done the same thing exactly. So it's important that, you know, good managers know how to take educated risks. That's one. And exercise good judgment. So now let's go to these four parts. So, and after this, we end our, our lecture. Okay. So planning, organizing, leading, controlling, P-O-L-C. Okay. So planning, let's start with planning. Planning is the most fundamental of all the management functions. So your managers, your leaders must be good in planning. You have to know that. Okay. Uh, at the very least, their competency in planning has to be well established. They have to be good planners. So planning, by definition, it's a technique to project expectations, anticipate problems, and even guide the decision making. Okay, so, and planning can be you know, subdivided further. You can have a massive plan that cuts across multiple years, or you can have a plan just, let's say, for the day. An agenda is considered as a plan. And SWOT, this is probably something that you've encountered in, perhaps in your own experience, let's say working in, a, in student orgs as well. Uh, SWOT is the, one of the more basic methods in planning. So SWOT, S-W-O-T, is a structured planning method used to evaluate four things, okay, which is indicated by S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Okay. Strengths and weaknesses, these are internal to the organization. Opportunities and threats are external to the organization. So that's how you look at it. Strengths and opportunities are considered positive. Weaknesses and threats are considered negative. So that's why SWOT is very simple. It's quite robust. But later on, as you study management and as you work, you know, when you start working in organizations, you'll realize that SWOT is more than meets the eye. I mean, SWOT is just a starter method, but you, later on, as far as uh, as far as methods in planning go, there's there's a lot more. Okay, you should not be limited to just SWOT. But for our purposes, it's okay to just start with SWOT. So this is a stylized example of a typical SWOT analysis for Google. Okay. Uh, but you'll also realize that Google doesn't use SWOT, or at least not extensively. They use another method known as OKRs. OKRs stands for Objectives and Key Results. So you don't, they don't really use SWOT that often now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, books that talks about uh, the planning process of Google. But, but let's look at the stylized example for SWOT. Okay? So you can see that we have strengths. We also have weaknesses, okay, opportunities and threats. I'm not gonna go through them each one by one, but at least in this particular slide, you'll notice that it, uh, it talks about uh, uh, specific items uh, in, in these four quadrants. And they're usually designed as, as quadrants. So if you've noticed, the upper part talks about internal to the organization, the lower part talks the external. The one on the left, strengths and opportunities, talks about the positive side. The ones on the right talks the negative side. Okay. So this would be a typical uh, worksheet. Sometimes you just need to have a blank board or blank sheet. You just quarter your sheets. Okay? You have strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, strengths, and you can just do bullet points for each one. Okay, so, so that's what you normally do. Uh, you can do this on your own. I mean, uh, Maybe in your own student orgs, if you're part of a student org, maybe you'd want to write, uh, do a SWOT analysis of your student orgs. But I, I won't let you create your team SWOT analysis now, okay? Now, what are the different levels of a plan? So as I said earlier, a plan can be long-term, it can be something in the moment, but in our case, what are the different levels of a plan? So you can have a strategic plan, something that articulates the longer-term objectives, 
of an organization and the executive management's vision of how the organization intends to achieve those objectives. So it's broader, it's more long-term, okay, futuristic, far-reaching. Okay? That's a strategic plan. Or simply put, a strategy. Okay. But you have to be careful. A strategy is not exactly or equal to a plan. Okay. A strategy would imply that there's a plan, but a strategy is not a plan. Okay. Now, what's another level of a, of a plan? A program. Okay. A program level plan. So within a program or within a functional area, within a division, you translate those strategic plans into those functional areas. Okay, and mainly to coordinate activity across functions up and down the layers of an organization. And the last level of a plan is a project plan. Okay, you'll talk more about the project plan in your project management course. But for this purpose, okay, a project plan is something more specific. It's more granular and lays out the specific tactics that need to be followed by the members of the organization in order to execute the strategy. So you can see that there is a fine thread that connects all of these three levels. So strategy is the broader, longer, far-reaching plan. Project is very specific. Okay. Uh, very specific, very detailed, more granular, as it says here. Now, you can uh, see these different types of, of cuts of, of the three levels of plan, okay, for the strategy or strategic plan. So we answer the questions, where are we now? Where do we want to be and how do we get there? Okay. There are many books that talk how to really properly formulate a strategic plan. Uh, sometimes, and, and this, is a, this is a good uh, start, you don't ask why. A strategy is, isn't about answering why. It typically answers where. Okay. Where are we now? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to play in? That is the question for strategy. Where? When is, is something out of your control at times? Because you also have external factors to consider. But the location, where, where you want to be, that's something that's pretty much within your control. Okay. Now, program, this is based on functional areas, your budget plan, your marketing plan. A project plan can be just calendar events, division of tasks, or your work breakdown structure. You'll encounter that eventually. Uh, your resource plan, that's also a project plan, a project level plan. And expectations of quality and completion of work, so your quality plan, your quality management plan. Okay. So for the second function, the O. So we've talked about planning, now we talk about organizing. Organizing is forming patterns of relationship among workers and making optimum use of resources required to enable the success in carrying out of plans. Now, under organizing, you have concepts like the operating model, so that's part of organizing, or the business model, that's also another thing that you'll encounter. But definitely the, the, the manager, if it does the organizing process well, well, it has to understand how to use the people inside the organization and how to use the resources as well. Now, leading, okay, determining what must be done in a situation and getting others to do it. So leadership, as I said a while ago, is also a separate field. It's a different consideration. Okay, so we have that. And lastly, controlling. So controlling activity of observing, monitoring, okay, observing a given organizational process, measuring the performance compared to a previously established metric, and improving it where possible. So these are the four different processes of management, POLC. Okay, so a manager, or even a leader for that matter, should have a good appreciation and understanding of POLC. Now, when we talk about controlling, so there are four elements of control. Okay, so the process to be controlled. So what is it that you're, you want to monitor or control? There's the sensor. So how do you measure your process? What is to be measured in the process? That's the sensor. The comparator, okay, so with what was measured, what do you compare it to? Do you compare it to a goal? Do you compare it to a historical benchmark? Do you compare it to a competitor benchmark? So the comparator does that. And the activator is based on the information gathered by the sensor and the comparator, what do you do now? What is to be done? 
So these are the four elements of control. Uh, later on, we'll, we'll unpack more of these things. What are the usual sensors? What are the usual comparators or the usual activators? Okay. And typically when we talk about the controlling process, uh, this is the function of quality or quality management. So how do you know that a certain process is of high quality or low quality? So normally elements of control are, are taken into the picture, taken into the picture. So this is the last topic for, for, for today's lecture. So the management levels, okay. And there are three management levels or three categories of management levels. So you have your top level manager, manager, your middle level manager and your low level manager. So your top level manager is responsible for controlling or overseeing the entire organization. So they're the ones who develop the goals, strategic plans, company policies and make decisions on the direction of the business as well as the mobilization of outside resources. So typically they would be your CEOs or in the case of UNP or management committee. So they're the top level managers of the organization. Okay. In certain companies you have the president or the CEO and you have the C-suite. So as they say C-suite, so the chief operating officer. So anything that starts with C, so CXO, so X meaning variable. C, Chief X Officer. So it can be the Chief Operating Officer or the Chief Marketing Officer or the Chief Human Resource Officer or the, uh, you know, or the Chief Learning Officer. So you have all these CXO or the C-suite uh, leaders. Okay. So they're, they're the top level managers. Your middle level managers, so they're the ones underneath your top level managers, but they normally hold or manage a large organization. They handle functions or divisions, and they devote more time for, for these for, for, for these divisions. Executing uh, organizational plans in conformance with what top management defines. Okay. They also define and discuss information and policies from top management to lower management. So they're, they're in the middle. Okay. And most importantly, they inspire and provide guidance to low-level managers towards better performance. And typically, your middle-level managers are like your seedbed for eventual top-level managers. So when top-level managers leave the organization, either through retirement or if they have better opportunities elsewhere, then the middle managers become your top-level managers eventually. So, so that's, the, that's the process. Uh, and lastly, your low-level managers or your first-level managers, uh, some people would say, well, they're the ones who are really directly deal with the rank and file employees. Okay. So they focus on the control and the directing. They don't really have much planning to do because they just simply execute what's handed over to them, but they do some level of planning. Okay. Uh, they assign employees tasks, guiding and supervising employees on the day-to-day -day activities, okay. ensuring the quality and quantity of production making recommendations and suggestions and up channeling employee problems. So if ever the employee has some problems, then they bubble it up to their middle manager. And if it is something that the middle manager cannot resolve, then they resolve it to the top level managers. Now you might be asking, why well, managing employees? Okay, um, aren't managers also employees of the company? Yes, okay, that's, that's correct, okay. Uh, managers are also employees. Now, if an employee is not a manager, you normally call those employees individual contributors or ICs. You'll probably hear that in the future. So if you're not a manager, you're an individual contributor. Okay. Now, in certain cases, of course, managers also have to be employees themselves. So the middle level managers, when they're dealing with their lower level managers, these, these middle level managers act as if they're low level managers to these low-level managers. Okay. So, so that's that's how it is. So management is always a relative construct. Okay. Because a manager cannot just be a manager by himself or herself. Of course, there is a such a thing as self-management, managing oneself. Okay, yeah, that, that's that's true, right? But even if it's recursive, it's always relative. So if you don't manage other people, you manage yourself. It's always a relative construct. So in this case, when we're managing as a function or as a duty or as, as part of our work, it's always relative. We have to manage something or someone. Okay. 
And it's a big responsibility. So if you want to have a key takeaway in this overview on organization and management, well, managers have a big responsibility. They're entrusted some level of responsibility of other people. They're entrusted with resources. And, and, and these are the things that, that uh, needs to be borne in mind when, when we think about management. Okay, and with these, we end our uh, presentation or lecture on, on the overview of organization and management.